Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so delighted to have you all here and to have such a wonderful turnout for what's going to be a terrific speaker. I'm so pleased to have Jen Trady here to talk with us about her research. I met Jen a number of years ago, actually, when I first came to Citrus back in 2012, and there was an initiative called the Data and Democracy Initiative. So I think you'll see the nice alignment there. So uh, Jen and I have had conversations going way back about a number of these topics. Um, so we're, we're very glad to have you here. I'm Camille Crittenden. I'm Executive Director of Citrus, um, and we are a multi-campus research institute as you may know, we are headquartered here at Berkeley, but we're also live casting anywhere, but also to our partner campuses at UC Merced, Davis, and Santa Cruz. Um, before I turn it over to my colleague, uh, Professor Gail DeKosnick, who's the director of the Berkeley Center for New Media, who will introduce Jen, um, let me give you just a couple of quick updates about some exciting upcoming events. Next week is Data and Tech for All Week at UC Berkeley, and there will be a number of events going on right here in this auditorium on Monday. We will be live casting and having some interactive panels and talks from the Women in Data Science program that's being hosted at Stanford. Um, but we will also have uh, illustrious guests here, including um, Jennifer Chase, who's the new um, associate provost and dean of the School of Information. She'll be giving a keynote. There will be a panel discussion of others that I'll also be moderating around building inclusive data communities. Um, so please check out that schedule and come back here in the auditorium. It's all free um, on Monday. That will be going on all day. And then Friday, I also want to call your attention to the Women in Tech annual symposium. This year, it's devoted to cybersecurity. So reimagining cybersecurity for all will be Friday, March 6th, and that will take place mostly in Sibley Auditorium, but there will also be a career fair at the end of the day here in our atrium. Um, so please check that out and join us. It's going to be a really excellent uh, lineup, including a fireside chat with Dean Sujay King Liu and Window Snyder, who's the head of security at Square and has had a long career. Um, that is about all I want to say. Just um, check out the, the Research Exchange series. We'll also have a great talk by another uh, mechanical engineering faculty member next Wednesday, uh, Grace Gu. So I'm excited to hear from her as well. But I will turn it over to Gail. Thank you so much, Camille. Uh, my name is Abigail DeKosnick. I am director of the Berkeley Center for New Media, or BCNM. Uh, you can look us up at bcnm.berkeley.edu for all of our many events and lectures happening this semester and every semester. And uh, it's my great privilege today to co-sponsor this event and to welcome um, our fabulous alumna. It's always such an honor and privilege to introduce fantastic speakers at UC Berkeley and a million times uh, more so when it is an alumna. So Jen Schrady received her PhD in sociology and her designated emphasis in new media here at Berkeley. Uh, she is now a sociologist and assistant professor at the Observatoire Sociologique du Changement at Sciences Po in Paris. In this talk, The Revolution That Wasn't, How Digital Activism Favors Conservatives, Jen will discuss her research into online political mobilization and digital activism. Previously, Jen was a research fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in Toulouse, based at the Toulouse School of Economics, as well as the Maison des Sciences de l'Homme et de la Société, Université de Toulouse. Her work has been featured on CNN and the BBC and in The New Yorker, in Newsweek, Vox, the Washington Post, Wired, and Time. She was awarded the Public Sociology Alumni Prize at the University of California, Berkeley, this university, and has directed six documentary films. Her research includes the digital divide, digital activism, and digital labor. And she challenges the polarizing concepts of digital democracy utopia versus internet villain dystopia. Jen has a new book out with Harvard University Press that's become very famous and renowned all over the world, The Revolution That Wasn't, How Digital Activism Favors conservatives. In this counterintuitive study, she shows how technology, political movements, and the internet are shaping the face of activism today. Please join me in welcoming Jen Schrady to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. And I think I'm mic'd here so everyone can hear me all right. Uh, and thank you, Camille. And thank you, everyone, for showing up. It's such a joy to be back 
here uh, at Berkeley. My home department uh, is in sociology, uh, but this is where I did most of my work. I was able to get one of the coveted office spaces for a graduate student uh, here in this uh, amazing building that really inspired a lot of the thoughts and ideas that uh, I was able to research for this book. So, what I wanted to start out with, because I think uh, many of you may be familiar with this image. So for those of you who aren't, uh, this is from a television commercial during the Super Bowl, right? So people are sitting in gray, grim attire, uh, watching the screen here where their fearless leader is uh, basically telling them what to do, think, say. And in comes a woman dressed in what I love, 1980s, uh, great workout attire. And she swings the sledgehammer around and then smashes the screen and up comes uh, Apple introducing their first Macintosh, right? With this reference, of course, to uh, George Orwell's 1984, which is the year of the commercial, right? So a revolution, right? And in many ways, just five to seven years later, uh, there were actual physical knocking down of other uh, authoritarian symbols, right? Whether it's the Berlin Wall or statues from the Soviet era. So at that time, there was this idea that rising um, from the ashes of this bureaucratic authoritarianism was a revolution, right? And in many ways, digital technology was arising from those ashes to, to, in effect, be like a phoenix, right? And so many of you may be uh, familiar uh, with Wired Magazine. Sometimes when I give this talk in France or elsewhere, I have to explain a lot, but it's so great to be here where everyone knows a lot about technology, right? So in many ways, this revolution was supposed to be about the economy, right? So the cover here of Wired, it says, we have it in our power to begin the world over again, right? Reference to Thomas Paine, Revolutionary War, Time Magazine's Person of the Year in 2006, right? Was supposed to launch another revolution, a social media revolution. So you were the person of the year for creating online content. Facebook uh, became available to the general public that year. Uh, Twitter was launched, and soon after, the Time Magazine Person of the Year, five years after that, is the protester, right? 2011. That was a time where many of you may remember uh, when a lot of pundits, uh, journalists were talking about Facebook revolutions, Twitter revolutions, and if you read the inside of the magazine, that's the idea, that digital technology is this revolutionary form of communication that also enables revolutions uh, and social movements and activism to be different, to spread, and is part of this digital revolution. Now, slowly, we've gone from this more utopian period to a more dystopian uh, that started to chip away a little bit with Gamergate around online sexism. Of course, Edward Snowden with the increase in uh, awareness around the mass surveillance, but it was really 2016, which for many was kind of the dagger in the heart of digital utopianism, right? So that was not only uh, awareness around uh, Cambridge Analytica and questions around disinformation uh, with uh, Trump's election, but also uh, Brexit and really this reverberated Worldwide, So now we're kind of in this more dystopian era of the internet. However, there's still this sense that both in the academic literature and also uh, in newspaper articles, et cetera, that the internet is still key um, to social, political social and political labor and social movements, right? So the focus right now a lot on disinformation and this more negative view is on electoral politics. But there's this idea that digital technology has a really particular, amazing role with social movements. And that it can really overcome these power imbalances, much like uh, the Apple commercial. And I want to point out three Ps that I'll come back to later, right? So in the literature uh, around uh, digital activism, uh, 
three concepts are very common, pluralism, participation, and personalization. And even in this dystopian era, there is this sense, right, that if we just get rid of these villains, right, the Putins, the Zuckerbergs, the Trumps, that we can have our internet back, right? But neither the utopian or the dystopian pendulum swing really addresses more structural differences and inequalities. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So the overarching research question for this particular project is, has digital activism really created a level, level playing field, right? This idea of a more egalitarian, horizontal way to participate in social movements. And if not, what's happening? How are any differences manifested? So that's the general uh, research question for my book. And if we look at most digital activism research, Initially, there was an amazing amount of research, and there continues to be, on protest movements that focus specifically on events, right? They're often left-leaning, often focused on very visible, uh, plugged-in users, um, and often what we call successful uh, social movements, which is a big debate in the social movement literature. How do we define success? Um, but those that you know, are in the media, uh, and often the research itself starts online, right? And as someone who, uh, for over a decade, has been accessing hashtags and analyzing them, it's only become increasingly easier, and it's kind of fun, uh, especially in the midst of a movement, to access them. But the challenge is that we've then uh, focused so much on the online, and so much on these visible movements that in effect we've been selecting on the dependent variable, right? Arguments that digital technology has massively changed social movements, but we're only looking at uh, social movements that have high levels of digital engagement. So there's been some cherry picking, um, which made sense initially, but I wanted to take a different approach and look at the vast, a way to examine the vast majority of the everyday practices with social labor and political movements. So I took a very different approach. I did a field level analysis building on the work of McAdam and Baudet by looking at one issue rather than an international or national issue, what are local folks doing, right? Uh, I picked a statewide issue uh, that was not over here in California. Um, because when I started this project uh, here at Berkeley, it was hard to find an issue that uh, went beyond just the left or the center, especially the far right in this uh, San Francisco, Berkeley area. Uh, so it made sense to go to North Carolina. So the state barely um, went to Obama uh, in 2008. He barely lost it in 2012. Trump barely won it in 2016. So it's very much a purple state. Uh, so it had that political variation. I also wanted to make sure there was an issue that attracted groups from different social classes. Uh, and the issue is collective bargaining rights for public employees, so whether or not uh, university employees, like here at uh, uh, you know, public university campus, or firefighters or teachers, have uh, the right to a union contract. So this is a very contentious issue. And I found 34 groups that were organizing around this issue. But this was more than just uh, a traditional, or what you may think of as a traditional labor issue. Yes, there were some worker centers and labor unions, but it really operated more like a social movement in the, a state that had one of the lowest levels of unionization, right? So also I looked at civil rights groups, student groups, who were supporting this labor issue, this labor right, well, those uh, on the right were opposing it. Tea Party preppers who were preparing for some kind of economic or political collapse with guns and food, uh, as well as uh, think tanks, business associations, et cetera. So I'm not gonna get into a ton of detail today about the methods. I'm happy to talk about them later, but did both qualitative and quantitative analysis developing uh, a digital activism score for each group. Um, 
And if you want to look in the appendix of my book, I explain this score in more detail. But I wanted to go beyond uh, just looking at uh, Twitter metrics or Facebook metrics. Because at the time when I started this research in 2011, Twitter didn't really have a business model. Some people thought it was going to collapse. Facebook was uh, very prominent, but it didn't operate like it does now as a state. I didn't know if these platforms would continue. So I wanted to look at the general activities and uses that uh, people were and are using the social media to, tr to then be able to apply it to other platforms as well. So what I found overall by looking at uh, this digital activism score overall, but also by each platform and different activities online, was that, that there is a digital activism gap. Some groups are using the internet much more than others. And I found three factors, right? I mentioned the three Ps. These are the three Is, uh, inequality, institutions, and ideology. And these factors really amplify and build on each other. So just for example, right-leaning, more hierarchical groups are much more likely to engage online than left-leaning, less hierarchical groups. So first, though, I want to talk about inequality. And I'll go a little more in depth here than the other factors in the interest of time. So this really gets at this idea of pluralism. Right? that the internet is supposed to enable more people to be involved. And on a theoretical level, what a lot of uh, scholars and others have talked about is that in the digital era, we no longer have as high costs to participation. Right? And that costs are lowered, especially with online intense organizing. And you know, so for example, uh, you know, if we think about if anyone here was going to go down to Santa Cruz um, and support the graduate students down there, um, you know, when they were in the in the height of their fight, you know, we may have to, you know, pay gas to get down there. If someone needs childcare, they may need to pay for that. Um, so there are a lot of ways in which there are costs to participation, and a number of scholars have said, well, in the digital era, those costs are lowered, right? Creating a more pluralist way to participate. But I really wanted to map on my work on the digital divide and digital inequality to see if those costs really um, were as uh, prevalent for people from different social classes in particular. So I found um, pretty uh, widespread digital inequalities based on social class. Uh, poor and working class groups were simply much less likely to have an online presence, right? whether that was Facebook book or Twitter or websites. So uh, they're much less likely to even have a website. Facebook, there was a pretty strong uh, difference, uh, sometimes 50 times as much usage uh, in comparison to middle to upper class groups. But it was really Twitter that surprised even me, <laughs> digital divide scholar. Of uh, the over 60,000 tweets that I analyzed from all these different groups over the lifetime of them uh, being on or not being on Twitter, only one was from a working class group, right? So that's statistically zero. So if we think about using hashtags or other ways to really get at the voice of a movement or an issue, we may be missing uh, a number of people uh, and classes of people who aren't online. So uh, again, I'm not going to go into detail here right now, but that's just to show that across the different activities and across the different platforms, uh, this digital inequality uh, persisted. So, but what's happening? Why are we seeing this? So as I mentioned, I did a lot of qualitative work, did a lot of in-depth interviews, went to meetings, protests, events, and talked to folks, and found that there are organizational, individual, and contextual reasons. So first, organizationally, there uh, were um, certainly uh, tools and gadgets that some of the working class groups had, but they tended to be outdated. Maybe someone had a donated computer that you know, someone's sister had, had given to them, but you know, it wasn't working, or uh, the printer was already out of toner, uh, or always out of toner. Those types of things were super common with these folks. Um, there's also the question of digital labor, 
which I'll get back to a little bit when I talk about institutions, but is this general idea of just not having uh, people who, and, and the resources to have people dedicated to digital engagement, right? So one organizer said, you know, he had gone to a training on how to operate their website, um, but that was six months ago and he went to do it and forgot. Um, those kind of uh, comments were super common. Uh, but there's also a really key uh, piece to this, which is on an individual level, right? So what was happening there? So what I found was that individuals from these poor and working class groups tended to lack assets, right? Access, skills, empowerment, and time. So the first two factors we would expect from the digital inequality literature, lacking regular consistent access, having uh, skills, but there's also this question of empowerment um, that was very common. So one person, I put this picture up here uh, because one woman, when I asked her about using Twitter, she said, I don't get up there, right? So as a stratification scholar, that was amazing, right? She was literally demonstrating that's up here, I'm down here. Very common. Uh, that's for other people, right? So those of you who've studied the concept of othering, there was a lot of that happening. I'm not a compu computer person. That's what other people do. Um, so the other piece, though, is this question of time. So I don't know about you, but I sometimes feel I'm, my laptop is down here, my phone is right here, right? I'm just online all the time, and I study digital technology, and it's hard to find the you know, time away from it. But for folks who don't have that consistent, regular access to a variety of tools or have to share them or go to the library uh, or go to you know, your aunt's house to use the internet, um, time is a very different concept. So for someone who, um, this is a quote from someone, uh, they don't want to have the cell phone on you, right? Uh, nursing assistant at a hospital had to hand over his phone at the start of his shift um, and couldn't get it back till uh, uh, after his shift had ended. Um, and then had to drive, he lived in a rural area, had to drive a great distance. So he talked about just not having a lot of time online um, as much as he wanted to, to engage in digital politics. So the third factor is something that I really want you to think about in terms of uh, other cases that we can imagine with digital activism. So I'm looking at North Carolina and there's a very contextual factor there, but how can we apply uh, this idea of really digging into the local context to see why, if and why, we may be seeing some digital differences. So North Carolina is part of the Black Belt South. It was a former slaveholding uh, area. I talked to a lot of African American and white and Latinx folks. But uh, the idea of retaliation for organizing that was a strong remnant of slavery uh, was still very prominent. So one worker I talked to, uh, he said that when he started to organize, uh, he found a rope tied uh, in the form of a noose dipped in red paint in his locker, right? African-American worker, as a form of intimidation and as a reference back to lynching, right? So over, you know, since Reconstruction, there have been a lot of ways in which uh, Southern African-Americans who've tried to speak up, there has, have been also um, very, or often very violent retaliation. Right? So there's a general fear of organizing. And not that it doesn't happen, it happens quite a bit. But as a result, people talked about the, the need to, to organize collectively. Right? Um, and that is in the form of worker center, churches, unions, community centers. And if those institutions were not online, or online as much, it was something that people talked about feeling fearful. Right? that they felt like this space was too individualized, um, and trusted institutions could provide a safer space. Now, I, I put this picture up here. It's just a reminder. I know some of you are familiar with the Greensboro Massacre, which happened uh, in North Carolina decades ago. But one uh, activist I talked to still had bullet fragments in his head when the KKK opened fire and killed five uh, union and anti-racist uh, organizers and so this fear uh, still continued and it affected how people used uh, communication tools particularly um, the internet 
So what about middle to upper class advantages, right? So these advantages were for groups on the left and the right. And I just happened to put a picture here of a Tea Party activist uh, leader that I interviewed. And um, she posted this uh, picture of herself on the top. It says, God, country, and family. I'm just a mom and a patriot. Don't mess with any of the aforementioned, right? Holding a gun. So if we think about this fear factor and how likely it would be for a black working class activist to post a picture like this, right? We can begin to see some of the challenges um, that people from different social classes have in participating in this online digital space, right? So much less evidence of fear, or really I didn't see any evidence of fear uh, with the middle to upper class uh, activists. So if we loop back to these theories around uh, lowered costs, I found that in effect, costs were not lowered equally, right? And certainly weren't eliminated. There's always costs to uh, participate. They've just shifted, or perhaps we already have these tools and these skills um, and these assets. And for some, the costs were too high to um, coordinate effectively and really engaging and using online tools. So just as an example, um, organizers that really wanted a diverse array of people to participate um, often talked about all the different ways um, that they had to contact people. Some people just didn't have internet access at all, so they had to go to their home. Others wanted to be text, or they had to call, or they had to do a Facebook or a, a, you know, message, or just so many ways. And if we think about maybe some of our family members, right, we communicate with them now in different ways. So that idea, right? So a lot of organizers talked about how it felt even more overwhelming with all the digital tools to really get a lot of folks involved. Um, and I have a new paper out where I talk about this question of thinking about digital inequality and differences, especially in the political arena, not just with uh, traditional socioeconomic indicators like income or education, but also class power differences and how something like the fear factor can shape uh, digital inequality. So just briefly, I'm going to talk about the next P, participation, which is really the heart of uh, digital activism literature overall, this idea that institutions are simply less relevant in the digital era, specifically organizations. A wide variety of theories, uh, just to sum up a few, Bimber talked about this era of, of digital activism being post-bureaucratic, right? Much like the smashing of the, the bureaucratic symbols. Um, Rainey and Wellman have a book out where they talk about networked individualism. Castell says that this is a new species of social movement, right, where we are much more horizontal or rhizomatic. Tufeki in her uh, book on Twitter uh, engagement talks about networked protest. Dave Karp has a somewhat different take. Um, he says it's not that organizations aren't relevant anymore, they're just different kinds of organizations. But generally there's this idea that organizations just aren't as necessary in terms of their traditional uses. I, however, by looking at a wider variety of groups, found that groups that were more hierarchical had more levels of decision making in their organization and had more staff, so more bureaucracy, had much higher levels of engagement and participation online than groups with fewer staff members and that were less hierarchical. Now this gap would be even wider if I had included a lot of the Tea Party activists, for example, who spent a lot of time um, organizing and engaging their membership online, but these were volunteers. So briefly, I talk in the book about this idea of digital bureaucracy, right? So groups that were able to really sustain high levels of digital engagement had um, people in their organizations that were dedicated and were expert in digital technology, right? A division and specialization of labor, right? So someone who understood how you know, we all know the algorithms of these social media platforms are constantly changing. Um, you know, sometimes a picture really helps, sometimes a wording of something helps. So really understanding what could possibly go, go viral, including um, what I call manufactured personalization, right? So if you think about the last tweet or Instagram post or something that just got a lot of attention, right? It's often something that 
at least appears to be a very personal story, right? Um, but I found that groups that had more uh, digital bureaucracy had the expertise and the people focused on uh, this use to really understand how to tweak uh, and to manage uh, this uh, personalization. So this, this third P of personalization also relates to the overall ideology factor, right? These three factors that shape the digital activism gap. So many scholars have said in this era, ideology is just less relevant with digital activism because no longer do we have these big dogmatic organizations uh, like in the Apple commercial telling us you know, what to think politically or what the political line is that we can come to the activist table online as individuals. Other scholars, uh, Karp has talked about that it just depends that in the digital era, it depends on which party is in power and people who aren't in power, the out party effect, tend to engage more. But the vast majority of literature doesn't necessarily really address ideology, um, but implicitly there's this idea that it's more left leaning, right? Which gets to some of these theories and arguments around affordances or the architecture of the internet being more egalitarian um, and uh, participatory. So more of an implicit argument. So one thing I just wanted to throw out that I think uh, kind of sums up the general tenor of a lot of both the literature and the media um, representation of the use of digital technology. It's that left-leaning groups right, are perceived as very bottom-up and grassroots in using digital technology, right, very participatory, whether we're talking about Obama, Occupy, AOC, et cetera. And what we hear a lot about is you know, conservative or right-leaning digital use is top-down, astroturf, people are dupes, they're just kind of falling in line with Trump's tweets or uh, Russian bots. And what I wanna do today is trouble <laughs> these perceptions. Um, so first off, I found that reformist right-wing groups had much higher level of digital engagement than radical uh, left-leaning uh, organizations. And with the digital activism score, I created an index. So the top five groups in this index um, were conservative and simply use the internet more. So um, I'm not gonna be able to do a whole discussion and lecture today on what ideology is, um, but just very briefly. So I can uh, conceive as ideology is much broader than ideas uh, or political orientation, but really draw on Gramsci to also include practices and institutions. But if we just take conservatives as, as um, one way of thinking about this uh, in this research, that conservative ideas overall with both my interviews and the content that they were posting was focused on freedom, right? Freedom from the state, right? From big government, they would often say, free markets and freedom of information. This was key for folks. They felt like the mainstream media wasn't covering them accurately. One activist said, I started noticing this, this news is getting biased. I prefer Fox, but they're not foolproof. There was a lot of criticisms of, uh, criticism of Fox News. A lot of the activists I interviewed were very well read, read a lot of news media um, and other books, um, but still felt the media was biased. So I talked about ideology as also being about practices, right? So a key uh, way to conceive of these practices with the internet was this idea of digital evangelizing, right? Uh, remnants of uh, Christianity, right? Spreading the word uh, and getting this information out, or as people talked about the truth. So I put this in cap, capital letters, because that's what people talked about, revering the conservative truth that they needed to get this information out. We need to know the truth. That's one thing I try to do. Find out the truth and tell others. Now, one activist said, Paul Revere had a horse, we have the internet, right? So this, is, this idea of riding around and telling the truth. Um, and when I would talk to conservative activists about the internet, their eyes would just light up, right? They felt like it was this amazing way to uh, spread the truth uh, and go beyond the mainstream media. Whereas left-leaning activists, when I would start talking about their internet use, you know, the common reaction was like, oh my God, <laughs> 
we should be doing more. <laughs> we should, we should, we need to update our face, you know, we need to update our website and, you know, do more online. There was more of a resignation because for them in general, again, they were trying to get a lot more folks involved and digital technology was just one of many tools to do that. So also with practices, um, I, uh, with some help from some great undergrads here at UC Berkeley, um, uh, analyzed the content of both Facebook, um, Twitter, and their, their websites, um, and found that generally uh, digital um, technology really, especially public platforms, weren't really used for organizational debate. It was used somewhat to encourage participation. But where I found the difference in terms of left and right was uh, that conservatives tended to link to articles in their posts, right? Much more likely to, to um, link to articles. And uh, those articles were more likely to have what I coded as contentious content. Now, did this, you know, we did this research before people were talking about fake news. Maybe that would have been the code now. Um, but basically contentious content was anything that wasn't a straight up news article. And a straight up news article could come from Fox or the New York Times or another news outlet. Um, something that was much more opinionated, didn't have any substantiation and was very controversial. Um, so other research has shown something similar that conservatives are more susceptible and consume more fake news, but the actual effect size, the actual amount still is pretty small with their news diet. And I uh, observed that as well. So we had the conservative ideas, practices, and institutions, right? This connection, this idea of civil society. So there was a very unified way in which a conservative media and digital ecosystem was operating, right? Uh, first off, just grassroots patriot groups were linking with each other much more than those on the left, uh, often linking to a variety of uh, news articles, mainstream and conservative. Um, but they also were going to a lot of trainings and events, right, uh, to really learn more about uh, digital media. So I put this picture up here. This, at the time, was the head of Americans for Prosperity, um, which is a Koch Brothers funded uh, organization. The other guy was head of the, the North Carolina um, wing of that. Um, so yes, there was um, some money coming in, but a lot of, of it was this cross-fertilization. I was at this event with a lot of grassroots Tea Party activists, and they're the ones that told me about it and invited me. Um, however, I think we need to go beyond propaganda, right? This isn't simply um, just the Koch brothers putting money into uh, conservative uh, media organizations. So those of you who studied um, media theory, and I have Gail to thank uh, for my education and a lot of digital theory, is a, very, is a theory that was debunked a long time ago, was this idea that we're just injected with information, right? And then just robots all consuming this information in the same way. So that theory has been debunked, but it, it's almost as if we've come back to that in this disinformation panic that, that um, that we're in, right? That there's this idea that people just have empty heads and they're just going to believe any of this fake news. Um, but I found that people aren't, were certainly not being duped. Um, and I'm not trying to you know, say that disinformation isn't a, a problem or an issue, but we have to think more broadly of what the context of that is. So one leader, one Tea Party leader I talked to, she had a master's in education. Uh, another uh, leader of the Crystal Coast Tea Party had a PhD in physics, right? So a lot of the folks I talk to and the activists are very educated. They're not um, just blindly believing anything that comes across uh, their feed. And so if we come back then to this broader view of ideology, right? So I talked about right-leaning groups being really focused on freedom. Left-leaning groups I found were focused on fairness. And it's not that there isn't a Venn diagram with some crossover. Those on the left certainly uh, can be focused on freedom. But in general, that was a key difference, such that those on the left were really focused, again, on this diversity, this inclusiveness, this grassroots organizing with trying to get a lot of folks involved. And as a result, there were a lot more diverse messages, which made it more difficult to get something to go viral, right? So 
the left, right, focused on egalitarianism. Despite this one labor issue, these groups in general were involved in LGBTQ issues, civil rights, um, student issues, gender equality, right? Not as simple as a straightforward freedom uh, message and, and that their focus, uh, the left's focus on organizing versus the right's on evangelizing really made a difference then online. Um, and of course, the right-leaning groups were much more unified institutionally with this ecosystem, and those on the left were much more fractured. Um, and the filter bubble theory, right? That's something that people talk a lot about in terms of uh, different political ideologies. You have people on the left looking at one thing, on the right, on another. Certainly, I found that, but the filter bubbles were different, not only in content, but also structure, right? So. Uh, left-leaning activists when, I, you know, we would observe their uh, uh, images, right, and coded those. Oftentimes what they would post, for example, on Facebook, uh, activists maybe after a meeting would stand together, maybe with their fists raised or just smiling, and post that on their Facebook page. Now, maybe, you know, with, with very little engagement, right, maybe they're mom or you know someone else who's in the picture would like it but much less shareable rather than conservatives are much more likely to uh, post memes right focused on this message of freedom so how ideology actually operates with digital activism more broadly I really want to emphasize that civil society matters we can't just think of information as individual uh, Facebook or Twitter or Instagram posts or messages on WhatsApp, um, that there was this ecosystem and these grassroots conservative organizations in particular were really key and a part of that. Um, so I'd argue that ide ideology does matter with, um, with digital activism and that Dave Karp's out party theory is certainly relevant in this case in terms of what was happening nationally, but it's much more than that when we have this broader uh, definition of ideology. And in effect, we have the manufacturing of digital consent, right? To borrow from both, both Gramsci and Chomsky. Um, and so we have this convergence of ideas and practices and institutions that are very resourced, structured, and grassroots, right? And we can't forget about the grassroots piece in terms of the conservative online dominance. So in effect, these three eyes, ideology, institutions and inequality really challenge the three P's, right, of participation, pluralism, and personalization in the digital era. So I want to leave you with one of my favorite movies, an uh, image. Um, many of you may recognize um, this from the Holy Grail, right, and that right now we're really focusing on, you know, just tackling disinformation by you know, just trying to find this one villain, right? If we could just regulate Facebook to death, right? And all of a sudden this would be solved. And the reality is that there are these broader structural issues that have challenged this idea of a digital revolution in terms of activism, regardless of what kind of platform uh, we're talking about or how regulated it is. So thus, it's the revolution that wasn't. Thank you. So I'm happy to entertain questions, comments. Hi, that was wonderful. Um, I may have missed just a little bit at the beginning, but I was wondering if in comparing the left and right group activity online, if you noticed patterns of out-group engagement versus in-group engagement. So we talk a lot about the, particularly on the left, the activism that takes place often ends up being internally focused where there's um, you have things like cancel culture and um, clapback culture and things like that where people aren't doing progressivism correctly or um, sort of where they fall in line in the progressive agenda um, and you don't see that quite so much on the right, it seems like, and as you've shown, it seems like there's more of a unified message, but did you happen to sort of analyze that focus of the, the messaging as much as just the, the type of messaging that was going yeah. on? No, that's, that's a really good question. I think kind of gets at 
um, you know, I had a number of ways to analyze and think about and really question some of this data, right? So I did have that um, very brief <laughs> graph up or the table where uh, I did find that neither the left or the right were really using public platforms or email. I couldn't measure email for privacy and a number of other reasons, but I talked a lot about that, right, um, with folks and they talked to me. Um, so I actually didn't notice a difference in terms of how much people were using those technologies in terms of organizational debate, like you're discussing. Um, between the left and the right. Um, but absolutely, um, I think you, you really hit the nail on the head in terms of conservatives really thinking outward in terms of the types of posts, right, that really helped kind of spread their message, build, rather than those on the left were, were focused on this collectivity, right, idea. And I think that made a big, a big difference in terms of the digital engagement. Hi. Um, so my question is, if you were thinking about what you just presented in a very simplistic way, on the left you have the politics of empathy. In fact, there was a speech recently by some professor of pol political science here about his book, I think was called Leaning In, which was describing the empathetic politics being successful in a number of campaigns. Alternatively, you have the politics of rage, which are essentially what the Tea Party's about. Unfortunately, Facebook, Twitter, and other entities make a lot more money off memes of rage than empathy. Empathy doesn't sell by being forwarded to a, to a million people, whereas rage does. So from a political ideology standpoint, how do you address that in terms of changing the balance of things? Because the left has to sell themselves online against those memes. Um. So, yeah, so your comment that, that there is that difference. I mean, I think that the empathy piece that you raised, uh, another way to think about it is this organizing mentality, right? So kind of classic Saul Linsky way of starting where people are at, right? What's happening with them, trying to organize, get them involved that way, right? And digital tools simply aren't always the best way to do it. They, they can be, certainly, but not always the best way to do that type of organizing. And, and absolutely, you know, that idea of outrage over um, what's happening came up in terms of the data, also coded the, the main issues that came up. People were certainly at this time, you know, outraged uh, over Obama or Obamacare, et cetera. Um, and you still see that uh, today with a lot of what's happening. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that, you know, in terms of what the solution is, <laughs> I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, for groups to really look at these three factors, right? It's not just a matter of building a really cool platform, but really thinking about how you're going to use that platform. And maybe some groups, you know, getting back to the other question, you know, maybe sometimes it's to build internally rather than externally, right? But just to be really conscious about kind of that external or internal organizing, if you want to reach more people, uh, yes, having a targeted, clear message that uh, will encourage people to repost or uh, engage with is really key, and, and certainly outrage is one of those. Uh, so uh, I noticed the title says how digital activism favors conservatives, but also talk radio favors conservatives. Uh, shouldn't you answer that question as well? So uh, I didn't study in particular talk radio. That would be a really interesting way to analyze it. And I think the, the interesting piece of that is that over the last um, kind of two decades, uh, really about, 50, about 15 years or so, there's been so much focus on the disruption of the business model of newspapers, right? That has been the focus on, uh, you know, fewer, newspapers actually existing, especially local newspapers, fewer investigative reporters, uh, news staffs being you know, down to maybe 10% uh, is super common. But there hasn't been as much focus on what conservatives focused on. Yes, some newspaper, but really there uh, was so much focus on other media, especially digital media and certainly radio as well. But that would, that would be a really interesting uh, question to examine more, definitely. Um, 
so there's been a lot of protests in the last decade um, with you know some successful and some not. Do you believe that as we move into this new decade that uh, social media and technology mm -hmm. have become more of an arm of authoritative governments rather than an arm of protesters? So there have, there's been a lot of good research on the question of the role of social media and authoritarian governments. Katie Pierce is one that I can think of. There has been a lot of other good research and certainly uh, elections, if we think about Bolsonaro in Brazil uh, with the use of WhatsApp, uh, et cetera. I mean, in, in some ways, uh, I think I have two answers to that question. Um, that, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that digital technology uh, is not new in that respect, right? Authoritarian governments have always been able to kind of capture uh, uh, any kind of communication tool and really use it to effect. Now, certainly there are ways in which people uh, can challenge that, um, but I do wanna make one kind of side point to that is that, uh, you know, it's not always just authoritarian uh, governments, right? It's also my point about civil society. We really need to think about civil society. So, to, you know, a, a colleague here at Berkeley, Dylan Riley, has this research out where he examines and compares uh, European countries, kind of simplifying this, but that ended up uh, 100 years ago becoming fascist, right? And so rather than coming in and filling a a void of civil society, right? It was the countries that had a strong civil society that were more likely to become fascist, right? So if we're talking about the left or the right, grassroots organizing um, uh, and civil society organizations are really key to think about in terms of the use of these tools. Okay, we have time for one more question. And Mr. Arman, yeah, he raised his hand. Um, did you get into any of the um, censorship on uh, search engines because the, the order of results in search engines turns out to be tremendously important. I know a couple years ago when Google changed its algorithm, the, the World Socialist website reported a dramatic drop in it, the number of hits they were getting off the net, as did a number of other leftist groups. So um, did you at least engage this in terms of complaints from activists on both sides? Uh, I really want to read more <laughs> research on your, the your question you're asking. I think, I think it is really key, um, kind of both a personal level as well as a professional level, like Google search results to me are just getting awful and terrible and you know run by ads and corporations and it's harder to find that grassroots information. Um, it's not something that did come up in the interviews and it wasn't a research question that I had. Uh, but I, I, I do think it's a really uh, important area of, of research, right, as this, as this continues, as this path continues. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming.